Guys, just to get us started, uh, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and a little bit of PowerPoint to explain where this came from and a little bit of what we're doing. And that, if nothing else, this will give you time to think about what you, how you want to talk about your project as well. And if you have something to share, I know, Kathy, you, you've had a, a little bit of a lead in on that one, but um, let me just see. Oh, it still shows me disabled. So, Camry, see if you can give me a. Okay. I know. All right, very good. Okay. All right, now let's see. Yeah. Okay, so everybody can see each other, right? And, and also see the presentation. So um, sort of by way of explanation, and I don't know if I can, let me see if I can hide that. There we go. Um, when, uh, when the conference call came out, I, I was uh, really thankful for this particular topic. Uh, and I knew we were in a uh, conversation with Lily, like many others were at that point, and um, was really uh, interested in how the REA might just be a place for us to begin to connect to each other. Now, I know since then, uh, Lily is becoming, the endowment's becoming very strategic about doing that through Amanda Drury and Indiana Wesleyan. And so I think everybody here, I'm assuming we're all going to see each other in Indianapolis uh, in the fall. Uh, but I did reach out to Karen Marie and said, you know, can I do maybe a poster of what we're going to do at NTS? And, and Karen Marie was good enough to say, why don't you just host a conversation? And that made absolute sense. So just to let you know what we're doing at NTS first, just to give you a little sense. Uh, well, before I do that, I always get ahead of my PowerPoints. Um, I will ask everybody just to give you a name and setting, whether you're in the parenting initiative or in the worship and prayer initiative, uh, tell us a little bit more about your project. And then if, if we can hold general questions until after all the intros are done, that I think, and we're not a big crowd, so I think we'll have plenty of time for a crossover conversation. Uh, honestly, I didn't know when to introduce this because I didn't know when we were going to get the grant. Um, and those of you who know what that feels like to be in the waiting period uh, was part of it. But ours, we are part of the work, prayer and worship initiative uh, instead of the parenting initiative. Um, Leon, I know, is in the prayer. Actually, Mike King, who I hope could join us, uh, who's the president at Youth Front, is also a recipient of one of the grants, initial grants on the parenting side. Um, our project right now, there are about 30 plus participants uh, involved in the worship and prayer initiative. Um, ours is called Nurturing Care with Children in Worship and Prayer. That's sort of our moniker. Um, and we actually, thinking about context, when we proposed ours, we decided uh, that we wanted to focus on sort of nurturing prayer among uh, children and also adults kind of focused to some degree on intergenerational interactions and prayer and worship. Um, and we did want to focus on diversity. So we are really splitting our context. Uh, we are working with one of our districts in the Church of the Nazarene in Northern California uh, that has four major language groups, has about um, 117 different expressions of ethnic and immigrant uh, worship uh, going on within smaller congregations. And we thought that would be a great place to work with a very diverse group of smaller churches, um, really thinking about intergenerational uh, efforts. Uh, but also we did want to give back to the Kansas City area where our seminary is located. So we decided to really stretch ourselves and we're taking on uh, part of the project working with children with autism. Um, uh, particularly in the Kansas City area, where there are some larger churches that have pre-existing pre disability ministries. And so I hope you hear, those are really kind of two really different contexts to see what it means to foster. And um, this language of care, I'll talk a little bit more about through and foster children's experiences of prayer and worship within these different contexts for a part of it. If there's anything that's holding our project together, uh, part of that really is a common approach. We're actually using design thinking 
Uh, so Karen Marie, I'm thinking about your article. We're trying to think more of the imaginative side of this with ministers. And uh, we're, we're going to create incubators, bring churches in from the ground up and think about how we might create prototypes uh, and implement those with children in mind. And then have uh, once a year, we'll do those incubators and once a year, we'll have a day of learning. Uh, but constantly be trying to learn from the prototypes through a bi-monthly reporting where we're going to ask uh, the different ministries to provide in the three languages we're using right now as a way of kind of curating narratives is either God sightings, times where children seem to be experiencing the presence of God, either in prayer or worship, uh, any humorous encounters uh, that they might want to report on, uh, knowing that sometimes it's through humor that we get some of our best insights, or some feedback from adults who are participating, congregants uh, in the congregation or adult volunteers or parents themselves as part of the journey. Um, and we are, we do have a couple of uh, crossover partners. One's the Northern California District, uh, which has some resource people there that we're working with. Here in Kansas City, the seminary doesn't have an extensive background in disability ministry, so we are partnering with an organization called SOAR, uh, Special Needs, which is a Kansas City-based national ministry and disability ministry, um, to give us some really strong background and cover. Uh, this language of nurturing care has been important to us. Um, really, um, Nazarene Theological Seminary over the last five years has been involved in a moral integration project where the goal is how can we uh, cultivate and inculcate a deeper sense of care in congregations. Uh, we're doing that with one of our sister schools, Point Loma Nazarene University. And so what we're trying to do is through our emphasis on prayer or worship, is to ask, you know, how can we also inculcate a sense of gratitude or trust or forgiveness or compassion as a part of that? And if you're curious, later I'll explain the background to that, but it is a part of a, a sort of naming a way in which the very presence of children might help the whole congregation deepen its own sort of posture uh, toward um, the virtue of care toward one another as a part of what's going on. Uh, we'll use those four major virtues in Northern California. Um, in here in Kansas City with the children with autism, we're not going to be that, that hands-on or heavy or, um, or normative in what we're doing, but we are trying to remind everyone that we're working with that the overall goal is when we're working with children and fostering prayer and worship experiences, that we want to exercise a posture of care in working with them. Uh, we thought that that was really important, knowing the differences and how different approaches to autism might occur, that if we just say that our focus is upon caring for children with autism as we're fostering these worship and prayer practices, it would help um, at least um, uh, ameliorate some of the different types of approaches in the behavioral and uh, socio-emotional kinds of responses inside the field. Um, and so I'm just going to turn it over to the other presentations at this point, um, and uh, I'll end my share. I'll just stop the share, and I hope that's enough at least to give you a sense of what we're doing at NTS, and I'll just invite each of you to introduce yourself again, where you're from, what your project's primarily focused on, uh, and then we'll just uh, share questions a little bit after. So who would like to go next? Oh, you, <laughs> okay. okay, Leon, I'll let you since you spoke first and uh, okay. see after that. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm Leon Blanchett. I'm a professor at Paulette Nazarene University. We're just outside of Chicago. And uh, I am a practitioner thrown into an academic world. So I've been a professor for 20 years, but I keep telling my students that I'm kind of faking it, that I'm really a practitioner. Um, the reason I came to all of it was to start a children's ministry program here. I've been a children's pastor since 1984, and uh, so started a children's ministry program here, and then that led into a family ministry master's degree program. So the topic of uh, equipping parents to be the spiritual caregivers for their children um, has been um, a passion of mine since the beginning of my ministry. How do I help parents? Uh, lead their children to be faithful followers of Jesus. Um, 
with that thought in mind, uh, Karen Marie, I'm very interested in hearing uh, more when you share, uh, as I read your paper um, on, um, you know, whose children are they and the role that parents play in that. So I'm really interested in hearing from you and engaging that and giving that thought as I work on my project. So uh, when Lily came to us, we were one of the invitational groups. Um, uh, I was quite surprised. Um, I didn't know how they knew who I was. Um, but uh, so anyway, they came our way and we, we began a quick turnaround process. So we were notified in late February that they wanted us to make a proposal that was due, I think, April 15th, if I remember correctly, or something like that. So uh, we moved quickly. What we ended up doing, uh, and a little bit of background here will be helpful, I think. The Church of the Nazarene is divided up into districts, and those districts are assigned to universities or colleges based on the locations in the country, uh, in the United States. And uh, so the states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin uh, within the Church of the Nazarene support all of that Nazarene University, and in turn, all of that supports them uh, in a variety of ways. So we decided to make the focus of our project uh, the districts, the 11 districts that make up the Olivet Educational Region, which includes 1,006 churches. And so um, our focus was what can we do to help those churches of the 11 districts that support Olivet? And so uh, we began doing literature review, doing some of our own surveys, we're getting ready to jump into some small group uh, interviews um, and asking the questions of what are the needs. And of course, the literature review has told us that. So we've kind of identified what we're calling the top 10 uh, uh, big uh, picture ideas. The top, what am I losing? The top 10 um, most important things that parents need to be about uh, in helping raise their kids. So that's going to, out of uh, the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna create, uh, working right now on creating a training curriculum where we will train trainers who will then train people in local churches. So we realize that if we try to do a conference of workshops for parents that no one's gonna show up to those. And so what our conferences will be on the districts will be training church leaders will then go back to their home churches and uh, provide training for parents. Uh, accompanying that will be a podcast that we will do uh, to support uh, those families. And we're looking for 100 families that will take a three-year journey, do a longitudinal study with those uh, 100 families. Um, that will uh, allow us to continue to study, to find out what's working, what's not working, to make adjustments to the curriculum and training along the way. So that's the goal. It's a pretty robust goal, I think. Um, uh, we've set the bar high for what we're trying to do. We're probably trying to do too much, um, but I'd rather shoot high and get halfway there than to have the bar kind of low. So that's the major focus of our project. Uh, my role at all of it has now changed. I am now kind of, I'm considered full-time faculty, but I'm only been teaching half time. The other half of my time will be directing this project. Out of this project has come a brand new center for faith and family, which I will direct. And this project will kind of be housed within that center. And hopefully that center will broaden and do some other things. But we think that with the podcast, it'll probably expand beyond just our region. And with some of the local training that we'll be doing here at Olivet, I think it'll also expand beyond the Church of the Nazarene. So while that's not our target audience, I think it's going to expand beyond them. So we're pretty excited about it. And I'm a little terrified, to be honest with you. Uh, this has taken me into some uncomfortable places. So uh, I'm excited about it, but also terrified in the same way. Well, I, I think that most of us are all in sort of the same space when it comes to that. So, um, uh, Ali, I, you were going to speak, so I'll turn it over to you. Sure. I took an opposite approach. I set the bar for myself very low. Um, <laughs> so I'm Ali Udley, and I am the assistant professor of liturgy and practical theology at Phillips Theological Seminary. 
and um am working on a worship and prayer initiative. So I I wrote out my grant proposal and I'm actually not starting the programming part of this until into next year um, because my contract is up for renewal and I'm finishing a book. So I needed to make sure I could actually do this project. But um, our project here is called Imaging and Imagining God. And it's designed around liturgical art and sacred space and trying to equip uh, local cohorts of church leaders to engage with um, some local artists. I'm hiring an artist in residence and to help them think more intentionally about how they create sacred space with the presumption that one of the ways that young children, um, people with disabilities and really adults too, one of the ways that young folks uh, encounter God is through space. So that's that's a really short answer, but um, it's a it's a pretty simple program, a pretty simple proposal uh, that's just about connecting churches with um, resources and um, artists. So, Dean, is it appropriate to jump in here a minute and make a comment about toward Ali? Um, if, if it can, well, and, and, or do you want to wait? Uh, why don't we wait so everybody okay, can okay. Okay. And, and we'll do it that way. So. Um, who would be next, Cheryl or Mike? Kathy, I'll probably, since I know you did a presentation, probably have you jump in on the back end, but um, Cheryl? I'm happy, I'm happy to go next, sure. Hey everyone, it's nice to meet you. I'm Cheryl Miner and I am the director of the Center for the Theology of Childhood at the Godly Play Foundation. Ah, and um, I work on sort of academic curriculum development, that sort of thing for the foundation research um, and also training. So those are all the areas that my work touches. Um, and we were invited to apply for the, uh, the parent support grant um, uh, along with many of you. And um, we we're thrilled to receive the grant. Um, even just the planning grant itself was um, really important to the work that we're doing. We did a, a big piece of research as part of the planning grant. Um, we were really glad to have the resources to make that happen, um, where we uh, took a look at both what uh, parents are saying about what they need and what they want to nurture their families' spiritual lives, um, and then also what congregation um, leaders are doing and saying about how they're trying to meet the needs of, of parents and families, and if there's any synergy there, right? Is what's, what's happening here? Um, we actually found a huge disconnect, uh, which was, um, really eye-opening for me as someone who has lived her whole life in the church. I'm an Episcopal priest and serve a parish um, part-time. And um, I, I've you know, been here almost 30 years. So I, I'm like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> so there was just this huge disconnect where parents, you know, I think we, I think those of us in the church feel like, oh, you know, things are so moving into a more secular way, especially on the coast. I live in the Northeast. Um, and um Parents aren't making church a priority anymore. It's not important for them anymore. Um, I think that's the kind of uh, the way we feel about the decline in attendance. And, and, and we're just making these assumptions about these families. When in fact, the people that we interviewed, the parents that we interviewed and spoke with and surveyed are hungry for, um, for resources and help in doing that work with their families and for themselves personally. Um, the part that's hard for those of us, especially um, in what I would call a more progressive tradition, um, Episcopal churches, for instance, and other mainline denominations, we um, is that they they have this distrust of the institutional church and of what the institutional church is doing for children, and aren't sure that that's what they want for their children. And these are mostly millennials and those younger uh, that we were talking with, and. Um, and that's, you're like, what, you know, what do you mean? You know, you don't trust us. And they're like, no, we don't. And um, so anyway, this led us to develop a whole proposal and uh, we are calling it Everyday Godly Play. I'll put a link to the page on our website in case you're interested in the chat. Um, and um, what we uh, heard from parents, right, is that they, they have this hunger for resources. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is um, expand on what we already offer as part of the Godly Play Foundation uh, on those resources to really empower parents and caregivers to 
foster a sustainable and integrated family spirituality that's just part of their everyday lives. That's what everyday godly play means, right? This is just, we're just really equipping parents um, with both um, the, the time and the space to nurture their own spiritual lives, the language uh, needed to talk with their children, um, the skills needed. Um, so often parents are afraid of religion, right? You know, because it, it could be a, something that's kind of filled with tension in their own home, right? Maybe the mom and dad don't agree uh, about religion, right? Or or there's um, some, some one one is more religious than the other or it you know it's just uh, so they just don't bring it up right and they 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 might go to church on Sundays they might not um but but they leave talking with their children about God to the professionals right they just don't they don't feel equipped to do that so we want to be part of do the work of equipping parents um so we're gonna develop an online hub. We, we have grand plans for this project um, that's filled with resources and inspiration and opportunities for community building, both um, online community building and in-person community building. Um, it will include things like uh, uh, materials to do biblical storytelling at home, um, vis uh, visual and audio resources for parents and caregivers, um, uh, on the topic of children's spirituality from the Godly Play framework, um, expanding on Berryman's stories of God at home to provide support for home-based practices, for narrative, uh, storytelling, wonder, play, and then the rhythm of ritual um, that, that, that is part of the church life, um, the, the liturgical life of the church. It will have a, a second kind of path for religious education professionals and clergy, um, a place to, for them to go and get better equipped to support the spiritual lives of children and their and their parents. Um, so there'll be workshops for church leaders on trauma-informed practices, um, current family needs, and other relevant topics. The first one is scheduled for October. Um, we're gonna um, have a guest speaker, um, have his book here. A Crosby, I think he calls it trauma-informed uh, child, children's ministry, right? He's going to be our guest speaker at that uh, webinar. And um, we have another uh, wonderful speaker coming, Sarah Drummond, who's written a book called Intentional Leadership. Um, she's uh, the, the dean of Andover Newton at Yale um, Div School, and uh, she'll be leading a webinar about her work on leadership in this kind of time of she calls it a, a time of liminality, if you will, where, where the old ways aren't working and we don't even know what the new ways are supposed to be. So to help um, kind of nurture church educators who are going through a time filled with anxiety and exhaustion and burnout, especially post COVID. Um, so we have grand plans for this online hub and we're really excited about it. We've hired a couple of grant directors to work with us, um, creative director and an administrative director. And um, we're, we're getting going. We have the first pilot of this will happen in, um, uh, when were they gonna start? Advent, in Advent. They'll have their 24 families that they're recruiting to be a part of the pilot project. Um, and um, yeah, we're excited about it. So yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any other questions about it, but thank you for the chance to share. Thanks, Cheryl. Mike? Mike King, not you front admin Zoom. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, is that what it says? <laughs> oh, sorry. I got it jumped on the wrong account. Yeah, um, we are connected to the Christian Parenting and Caregiving Initiative. We are calling it Presence-Centered Parenting, and uh, we're basing that on um, the theological work I've done on Presence-Centered uh, Spirituality. wrote a book, Presence-Centered Youth Ministry, many years ago, and then finished my dissertation with the wonderful advisement of Dr. Dean Blevins on Presence-Centered Spirituality, Living with Resonance in the Secular Age. <clears throat> and um, we, we're working in a, in a laboratory here. We have 40 full-time staff. Uh, working in a laboratory, we have more than 5,000 kids that are spending one to 10 weeks with us during the summer and all of our different camp ministries and um, community development projects, urban camps, day camps, kids camps, um, and, um, and, and then uh, several hundreds of, of 
college students and uh, about 500 um, what we call teen staff, which are the older uh, adolescents that are still in, still in high school. So quite a, quite a uh, big group to work with directly in uh, ministry. Um, but we're really uh, looking at the relationship they have with their parents and what spiritual formation looks like uh, in their home and their family. So we're developing a lot of resources. Um, we developed an app for um, daily interaction um, with um, with the, the parents of the kids who are involved in our programs <clears throat> and just having tens of thousands of hit on, on the apps. Um, so we, we're getting great traffic there. Uh, a website, blog posts. <clears throat> we developed uh, a curriculum this year uh, to add to the curriculum that we're engaged with with the young people. So uh, like we have a kid's journal, uh, day camp, and all of these are uh, going to the, the parents so the parents can actually uh, follow along and interact with their uh, kids. For instance, the day camp kids uh, that are coming in and out every day um, are engaging in what we call table time, windshield time, bedtime with different activities that their parents are, are really encouraged to engage with them. Um, and so we're getting really, really good response um, from, from that. <clears throat> we also have an extensive network of youth pastors that we meet with, that we train, that we're involving in our project, along now with uh, starting networks of children's pastors and family pastors. So we've done several network meetings with that group and uh, inviting them in to collaborate with us on our project and sharing um, resources. Um, we're also doing spiritual retreats for that group. Uh, we have a one spiritual retreat coming up and another one in a couple of months. Um, we're also doing uh, networks of grandparents because we uh, have this this feeling that sometimes it's the grandparents that are most concerned about the spiritual formation of their grandchildren. And um, we're just seeing some really cool stuff with that. Like even as I speak right now, we have probably 50 volunteers, grandparents with uh, kids, including my wife with our three grandkids that are uh, working at a um, we do the largest food distribution in Wyandotte County, which is a big county in Kansas, Kansas City, uh, largest food distribution of fresh produce. And uh, so they'll serve about 500 families today. And um, so yep, we have grandparents and parents out doing these formational things with with their uh, with their kids. So active involvement with our something to eat initiative. And um, <clears throat> we're also doing things like. Um, we did a, uh, a Last Supper uh, experience with uh, 22 grandparents and um, for their own spiritual um, impact and then uh, developing a way that they can then take that to their family, to their kids, to their grandkids. So a lot of experiential uh, formational stuff. Um, we're, we're also doing a, a really cool network with, um, so we've had about probably in the years, we're 80 years old as a, as a ministry, and uh, we've done camping for over 50 years. And so we'd ha we've ha had a half a million um, Kansas Cityans go through our programs in that time. And so, um, you know, I'm now working with the, um, the grandkids of the first kids that I worked with back in 1975. And so we're seeing this multi-generational uh, thing. And we have all these alumni. We're gathering these these either young parents or newly married um, uh, couples that want to have kids, and just having some great interaction with that group. Talking about what does it look like to think about the spiritual formation of our kids, even before you decide to have kids, and then what does it look like when you're actually pregnant with that child? And uh, I was able to do some really cool stuff with. Um, uh, with my daughter who has, um, who, who had their fifth child and incorporating their kids into, uh, engagement with their sibling, um, while they were, you know, during the pregnancy, it was really quite, quite beautiful. And, uh, we have, 
we have a, a group that are actually helping parents write songs for their children to sing over their children. Um, we just did a recording of a, a beautiful song that's kind of generic that parents can use as a lullaby. And it's just every time I listen to it, I'm still crying every time I listen to it. So I got to listen to it about 20 more times so I can talk about it without crying. But it's just really, really um, beautiful. But just the um, the exchange of information that they're having with each other of how to be intentional um, with spiritual formation has been uh, really, um, really beautiful. Um, we developed this resource uh, for, for parents. Um, it was our, our Holy Week experience, and it had all kinds of, of uh, experiential things to do incorporating the children. Um, and um, it was really, it was really quite beautiful. We had a lot of really good feedback. All of our kids um, this, this summer, our, our theme is seeking God's dream about God's kingdom. Uh, it's very abstract, you know, I did to get kids to imagine what a kingdom looks like, but we focus on God's dream um, and seeking God's dream and participating with God's dream for the world. And and so uh, just little things like, um, you know, when the, the, the parents come pick their kids up, we have this um, camp at home experience, um, which is a bread recipe. We give them yeast, we give them everything they need to, um, to do that. And then focus, uh, of course, on the, the parable of the yeast. So we're just um, involved in all that kind of stuff right now. I think we are set to do 300 resources in the next uh, four years. We have years of camp content that um, is experiential that can be, can be reformulated into uh, tangible experiences that can be used now. So we're also at work um, on that. And um, yeah, I, I just uh, the conversations we've had with pastors, with youth pastors, with family pastors, we're just really, I think one of the driving things theologically for me is this idea that, you know, Luther talks about, um, and Bonhoeffer talks about, you know, just the astonishing reality that a God came to us as a, as a child, as this little child, and literally this child had to be held. And um, what does it look like for our congregations, you know, to truly carry our children? Um, and maybe that's the metric we need to, to look at as it relates to what is a healthy congregation. Are we truly carrying our children? And um, so um, we, we feel like we have a lot of collaborate, collaborators. We've got a great creative team in place. Um, all of our staff have incorporated into their job description some aspect of pushing um, what we're doing down deeper into the, to the family connections. And so um, we're off and running, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, I will go ahead and say this. Mike can hear that song 700 times, and he'll still cry. <laughs> That's, he, knows me. he knows me. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, um, what, uh, I don't think you've had a chance to, to talk about your project here, so just bring us up to speed. Oh, absolutely. I'm Kathy Dawson, and I teach at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. Uh, we're part of the Nurturing Children Through Worship and Prayer initiative, and our project title is called Wonder of Worship. Um, I did share quite a bit about our planning phase on Monday evening, um, so I'm not going to say anything about that, but um, just a, a few things uh, related to the implementation phase that I didn't say on uh, Monday night. Um, our project is focused um, primarily on helping um, develop spaces of that are truly intergenerational worship uh, that um, help uh, move folks uh, to engage each other across generations and, um, and thereby creating space for children in worship. We're focusing more on the corporate worship aspect than the, the prayer aspect at the moment. Um, our activities are very complex <laughs> as opposed to what Allie was talking about. I'm, I'm often wishing that we scaled it down somewhat, but uh, anyway, uh, ours are both internally focused as a campus. We're a freestanding seminary with a lot of residential students. 
um, masters and doctoral students often who have families attached to them who live on our campus. Uh, a lot of those families are of our international students in particular, and we really have not um, been very intentional about nurturing the children that are already in our midst. Um, the seminary also sits within walking distance of three different private schools that have um, some spirituality attached to them. Uh, we have a, a Friends Quaker school within walking distance. We have a Waldorf school and we have um, Our House, which is a church supported um, day facility for unhoused um, children and, and um, work training for their parents. Um, and so all of those theoretically uh, could benefit from the beautiful spaces that we have on our campus and that we're creating on our campus that we could really nurture children's worship lives. Um, I did mention on Monday night that currently our worship occurs mainly in the mornings and so school age children are kind of excluded from that. So part of what we wanna do with the grant is open up more spaces uh, at times when uh, children are available to come. Uh, we're creating a full godly play classroom as a part of our worship thing. So um, Cheryl, I'm really glad that uh, godly play is involved with this. Um, Mary Hunter Maxwell is our regional rep, and she's been very helpful in the grant writing process. So we'll have that space. And I just uh, wanted to share a couple of pictures of our children's library space, which is phenomenal, but is very underutilized. Um, there's one. And then, um, see if I can share the other one. So it's a very large um, space with a lot of, um, good lighting, high ceilings and stuff. And um, we used to do storytellings when I first came on the faculty at Columbia, weekly storytellings that faculty and students would share with children. But those have kind of gone away uh, since we don't have a dedicated librarian um, attached to that space, but we're hoping to, to greater utilize that uh, as a part of this grant. Then the other aspect is more external um, and we are, a Presbyterian seminary, but we're not limiting our partner churches to uh, PCUSA. So we're hoping to get about 70 partner churches as a part of our project around the country. And we'll also have some international folks that uh, we gather with online as well, since we do have a high percentage of international students and some of them are on my planning uh, team. So uh, we will be creating a website, but we don't have one yet um, where we can upload uh, resources in, in a variety of formats. Uh, we're planning on doing monthly quick sheets with simple ideas that are um, shared from different congregations about what they're already doing to incorporate children more fully in worship. Uh, we're planning also to do podcasts. Somebody else was, was doing that. Um, two times uh, a year that will lead into regional gatherings. Uh, we plan to do four of those twice a year uh, with our partner churches. And um, we'll do some best practices videos coming out of that. And we'll also be doing some sub-grants allowing uh, churches to develop their own ideas and giving them the funding to do so. And we'll do that in two phases. Um, we'll be doing some more research. Uh, so I have a sabbatical coming up this spring, and um, I'm hoping to get IRB approval to do research directly with children around worship, because our conversations thus far have been mainly with um, adults and mainly educators in, in congregations. So I think that's all I'll say, although I will just say to Allie that if you weren't there on Monday night, my colleague, Kalia Williams, who's over at Emory, is doing a similar project to yours and would be a, probably a great conversation partner as you're um, dealing with the arts and uh, worship. So 
Yeah, we connected at the Liturgy Academy, actually. So but great. Yeah. Well, Kathy, thank you. Uh, and I, Marie, I didn't know if, uh, Kim Marie, sorry, um, if you wanted to uh, just kind of give us an update on what, what you've been doing as well, or um, I know you just, just curious from that standpoint. Sure. Um, so I'm Karen Marie Eust, and I'm the director of the Children's Spirituality Research and Innovation Hub, uh, which is kind of an umbrella uh, project for Lilly Endowment around children's spirituality, religious education, parenting, etc. Um, we were funded uh, shortly after the pandemic began, and as we all know, that did not go away as quickly as anyone thought. So we are, uh, even though we just finished our third year, it was really more like our first year. <laughs> Uh, because of the limitations of the pandemic. But we are um, we are funding research projects by academics. Um, the Search Institute did some work on um, the spirituality of elementary age children and also about um, uh, how parents uh, view spirituality in elementary age kids. Um, and one of our primary learnings was that parents are kind of squeamish about even the word spirituality anymore, uh, well-being, um, healthy, holistic, these are more comfortable words for a lot of parents. Spirituality has uh, tended to uh, fall by the wayside a bit, which was uh, so even, um, we knew religious and religiosity was suspect, but uh, that was a learning we come, took from there. Um, we have a project happening, happening at the University of Texas at Tyler, looking at children and trauma and, how, and the effects of that on children's religiosity and spirituality. Um, we have other small things we're going to, we have an article that'll be coming out written by a scholar, uh, rethinking discipleship in terms of children's agency. Um, and so that's one side of what we're doing is we are funding and promoting uh, research. Um, we also translate research into sort of everyday language for parents, caregivers, and organizational leaders, church leaders. So we have our website, realkidsrealfaith.org, and we drop new posts, uh, 500 words, and or a um, audio or vlog kind of thing every Tuesday and Thursday morning. Uh, although uh, in holiday weeks like July 4th, it might only be once on Wednesday, but almost every week is two times, Tuesday, Thursday mornings. Um, and so we have a range of things there that's translating social science and educational theory uh, into connections with spirituality. Um, and we are particularly thinking about the um, 60% of uh, parents who were not raised in a religious community, but are still wanting their children to have some sense of um, the importance of the transcendent or uh, meaning and purpose beyond themselves um, as, our, uh, as the audience we think of there. Um, and then the other side of what we do is uh, we find and support uh, small innovation experiments that people are doing. Um, so the paper that Aaron Rival, my associate director and I will be doing tomorrow is about uh, the Embodied Prayer Project that we just wrapped up. Uh, we've also done something called Holy Listening, which is sort of one-to-one -one using finger labyrinths and um, stones for children to talk about their feelings and their uh, and uh, big issues and that kind of thing in a one-to-one. -one. Uh, we have a storybook one going on now um, where people, uh, people are reading stories um, and engaging children in activities that are part of what we posted on the website. Um, we've had, let's see, I'm trying to think what else we've done. Anyway, we have these, uh, we're, we're about to do a spiritual questions, uh, teaching parents how to talk to kids about their spiritual questions and not freak out. Uh, that came out of a Center for Youth Ministry training course where some students took my book, Real Kids, Real Faith, and riffed on it. And then we uh, heard about it and, um, and are funding them to develop that further. Um, and so we just, we're, this is how we play. Uh, plus, we'll be providing support to all of the, all of you, and providing research that will funnel through Wes, uh, the Wesleyan setup um, and Mandy to uh, help you and support you in your project. So that is what we're about. I know, I know we've had people join us. Dave, I didn't know your, your name was there for a while, but I figured you were trying to do a couple of things simultaneously. Is that my hunch right there? Yeah, I was doing my own parenting project by folding laundry. Um, <laughs> cloth diapers never stop. Uh, I uh, so I'm a little bit of an interloper here for a couple reasons. Um, I uh, so a, a while ago, uh, you might know Tracy Smith's work, Faithful Families, uh, published through Chalice Press. 
So Tracy and I have been friends for a few years, and um, she approached me about doing a small research project to see what's that, what are families actually doing? Like, what is the effect of these practices on families? And shortly after we started thinking about that, they announced the Lilly uh, parent, uh, parent and, and Caregiving Grant. So she approached Chalice and approached me to kind of support her as the research arm. Um, and we are in a liminal space because we're not one of the 70. But they have the the Jessica, the uh, director of the program, asked the board to withhold a little bit of money so that we can revise and resubmit. So we're in that process right now where we where Tracy is revising the proposal to focus on a particular aspect. Um, and uh, and so I'm really learning uh, uh, a lot from from all of you. Um, our project uh, would focus on um, parenting and caregiving circles and and training. Uh, congregational leaders to develop cohorts of, uh, of of parents that and and cohorts of leaders that work with parents uh, specifically for for children age zero to three. So looking at the youngest uh, times and uh, incorporating family faith practices um, into their everyday lives and experimenting with with what that looks like. Um, so hopefully. Lily likes that, um, and and hopefully the next time we meet, I can say yes, we we got the check they've been holding for us. Um, but uh, thanks for for letting me listen and uh, and and share a little bit about uh, what what this this program would would look like. Okay, thanks, Dave, and it's I'm just good to see you too. So, um, yeah. Denise and Heather, if you guys don't mind, we for those who've been here for a while, I know we've got few questions people have been wanting to share with each other. So let me honor those who were here when we started first, just to see some crossover, if you guys don't mind, and just kind of listen in from that. So um, specific questions one to another. I think, Leon, at one point you had a you had a question that you were going to fire away on. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment for Ali. I'm sure she's run across this, but just in case she has it, are you familiar with the study that Barna and the Aspen Group are doing? on space no uh, making space for inspiration is the title of the document that they just sent me recently um we're trying to work um our project we're trying to do in conjunction with them to see if we have some overlap um, on their study but but this is the first of three that they're doing on the importance of space and so when you mentioned what you did it kind of prompted that in my thanks and uh, Cheryl, I think you're going to like working with Rob, Robert Crosby. He and I did some research uh, together on trauma and the impact on children. And so uh, his book is really valuable. And I hope he's good for your conference that you're having. Yeah, I, I will go ahead and say when Leon says he didn't know why Lily would reach out to all of that, one of the things that uh, he's not telling you is that Leon was a facilitator with a pretty pretty strong cross-disciplinary study. Some of you may know Aaron Smith, who's listed as one of the uh, poster presentations. And um, partially it's just because the denomination, the Church of Nazarene, we're not quite, I guess I can say this, we're not quite mafia, but we really do seem to be somewhere between the mafia and a really over large Southern family. So it's allowed us sometimes to do some really focused research and get good feedback in those kinds of studies. And I think Leon was a part of one or two of those in the past that just kind of showed that, that, that sort of denominational capability. And, and we've just finished doing one of those at our General Assembly, our uh, international gathering in Indianapolis just a couple of weeks ago. Um, other comments to each other, other questions in the presentations that you heard? Anything? This is always a trade-off between making sure everybody has a chance to speak and then people having a ping pong um, idea that sort of just stays suspended in the air for a while. I would ask uh, a question that might be a bit silly, but since I'm kind of new to this experience, it sounds like several of us are doing things where there might be some overlap or at least some connection um, and I think maybe the fall gathering is intended to bring some of that together, but is there 
is there a way for us to collaborate or at least have conversation beyond um, this time today uh, where some of that overlap could be, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I'm just taking notes as you guys are sharing. Mike, I'm thinking of some of the curriculum you've already created. I think it's going to be really helpful um, in my project, maybe to make those resources available to parents. How would we go about doing that? And Cheryl, some of the things that you mentioned, I'm thinking, yeah, that's exactly what I'm wanting to do. How can Godly Play be a part of what I'm doing? How can I connect parents to what Godly Play is doing? Um, so I don't, I don't know what I'm saying other than just asking the question of how that might all come together. Yeah, I'm, I don't necessarily have the answer to that. I think part of the reason for having this kind of a watering hole was to give us a chance to connect with each other through the association. That was probably one way to say it. And I do think a lot of times people pick up uh, through the professional relationships. This is just building a whole new network. Uh, my experience of um, Lily and particularly their long-term engagement in youth ministry prior to this sort of newer initiative around children was that over time that works really do begin to bond together. Uh, there's a whole generation, Mike knows uh, several of those who have who encountered youth uh, Lily's projects in youth ministry that build really networks over time. And it could well be, I wouldn't be surprised, Karen Marie, you might know more, that that's part of what their vision is and starting so many of these is to really kind of build a culture uh, and, and, and in some ways, it's less about individual projects as the culture that could be created out of all of these instantiations of initiatives uh, for the sake of the church. And uh, that's one thing I've always, I do appreciate about the Lilly Endowment is that they do at times try to invest enough in diverse places to uh, build whole new networks that probably never would have occurred otherwise, is the best way to say it. Well, Leon, um, I'll was, just, I'll go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just saying, going to piggyback on Leon. I, Leon, I was thinking the same thing um, when you were sharing. And uh, in fact, several of you just about, my gosh, we're creating resources that we can all participate in. And uh, so I think I've asked, I've uh, tried to connect on Facebook with at least four or five of you during the time we've been sitting here. So that's one way we connect. But um, the other thing I thought is that I've been uh, in, in dialogue quite a bit with uh, Kara Powell and the 10 by 10 uh, program. And so we've already submitted some of the resources we've developed in this initiative uh, to share within the 10 by 10 uh, thing, which you know has the potential to make this network and the sharing of these resources and you know resources are good but the the reality is that we have to we have to have, grow a passionate network of of uh, of ministers of youth workers of pastors of youth pastors who truly are you know passionate first of all in their own lives around spiritual formation and then curating communities of christian practice that extend out into the whole congregation so it's excited to be up, exciting to be a part of this with you all um here Marie, you were going to say something yeah i just wanted to underscore what you said dean um about how the the lily intentionally uh does both the invitational and as dave has noted there's now also been a competitive uh grant process for the christian parenting side they intentionally give a lot of these grants at one time in order to create a kind of um space where it's almost like adding yeast to the larger loaf of bread to see what can grow out of that and so the gatherings at indiana wesleyan really will be a part of doing that but that doesn't mean they have to be the only part because they um, they will be about sharing and um, and learning from one another and um, offering the wisdom that you've gained through what you've done and and having a bigger um, sort of a, a bigger pot of information because every person's talking to different people and then you bring all that together and suddenly everyone benefits from what everyone's hearing. But that doesn't mean that there couldn't also be um, occasional gatherings through the REA. Um, and now I'm going to put on my, I'm currently interim chair of the Academic Disciplines Committee. Um, after the business meeting tonight, uh, as the only candidate for actual chair, I will likely become the standing chair for the next three years. And one of the things we've been thinking about is whether 
you know, using the online webinar format might be a way to build um, connections among institutions and among uh, people doing various kinds of projects, as well as connecting graduate students into these kinds of things um, uh, and building on what they're working on and doing in uh, dissertation projects, et cetera. So if there's interest in having opportunities to gather um, and especially gather across Christian parenting and children in worship, because those won't necessarily be synced up in other ways, then I'd be happy to try and facilitate some, you know, occasional times for just, you know, 60, 90 minutes to talk and to share and to uh, do and create some Google folders where things could be deposited for, you know, commentary, et cetera. So if that's an interest, then REA can also support as well as Lily. And I, I'm a, I, I'd like that. I'm, I'm mindful of our time. So it's we're, um, one of the things I've learned is if you finish on time, you're actually a well-respected facilitator. Um, and I want to apologize to Denise and Heather uh, uh, for just being out of time from that standpoint. Uh, uh, but um, I think that would be, I mean, I do think this is how, I've, as I've observed a couple of other Lily initiatives, some of you know, the Processing Our Faith Movement and others, that it's these pockets of uh, partnership uh, that really make it go. And the reason I like this one is because it, as, as evidence in this room, we have people working within practitioner fields, as well as those working in academic seminaries. And there doesn't have to be that kind of bifurcation. This is a kind of place for that, that crossover partnership. So Cam Marie, I'll put in my boat for, for you to, to facilitate those um, and try to be helpful as I can as well. Okay. Um, uh, Dean, as Kathy's noted, so they did schedule this till 4.30. I know that we when we talked to them about it, we asked for an hour, but they did give an hour and a half. So if you're able to stay on, oh, I can stay. we could I can actually stay. hear from Heather and Denise. Yeah, so I let Denise, Heather, let's uh, now, I'm also famous for also closing meetings and reopening. So that's okay. So um, uh, Denise, you want to lead out? Well, I'll be brief because I'm going to have to leave. I came late and I have to leave early, apparently. Um, but I have to advise a student. But I wanted, I, I'm i not a, a member of an institution that got one of these grants. We intentionally did not apply uh, because we have so many other things going on. But I am a part of a team that's creating resources to support the grant. And just want to say that out loud, that we're creating two resources. One of them is called, they're both called Raising Faithful Kids. But another uh, way that they're used is the first one is a series of reflections written by parents about how they intentionally parented or caregivers about how they intentionally uh, were engaged with in faith conversations with their children. Um, and we've talked about faith, values, other things like that. Um, and then the second resource is what we're calling accessible scholarship designed to be used with a congregation in a virtual or in-person space um, to allow parents to read a little something, but not read an entire book. I mean, they could read something like Real Kids, Real, Real Faith, and that would be super useful because the book is put together to be accessible, but there are other things that would be um, just beyond. And so we're creating a resource that's just short chapters, 3,000 words, to equip congregations to have conversations with parents and caregivers in their midst. And those resources will be out next spring. So uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Karen Marie. <laughs> and there's, so there's opportunity if you're interested still to participate in that, there's opportunity uh, to do so. And we'd welcome folks who were interested, but I just wanted to make mention that one of the reasons why we stayed out of the grant was because there were plenty of people in it and denominations uh, doing this work, we as scholars decided to come alongside of it and um, and write something that we think is going to be super useful. So just it's out there. I it's coming out from Judson Press. Thanks, Denise. I appreciate that. Heather. Thank you. Well, I just, um, I'm from the Godly Play Foundation. So Cheryl already shared with you all. So I just wanted to jump on and hear a bit about the other projects happening. So um, yeah, so I think Cheryl probably covered covered what our project looks like. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, thank you. Well, any other any other comments or questions to each other? Um, not to belabor time, but just wonder. I I will go ahead and mention. I was thinking, Kathy, some of the with the, some of the pictures you showed. Uh, one of the one of one part of our proposal uh, actually is to build a sensory room uh, at the seminary. Um, which uh, are currently our seminary hosts um, three different churches as a part of the, the of the vocation. Uh, and we were thinking about public events and we thought if we were going to actually be involved in doing ministry with uh, children with autism, that one of the things we might do is build a space that's a, intentionally a sensory room, but do it uh, in also thinking about uh, religious symbols and, um, and actually I'm toying with and Heather, since you're here, you could mention this to Kathy, how godly play and some of the elements of godly play might be a part of that sensory space, just as a way of thinking about that space being uh, a little more intentional in the way in which uh, the imagery and the opportunities that they are, are more include religious artifacts as well as other types of things. So um, that one, I, I, I'll confess, and I think Ali, sort of like you, we 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 were in the middle of a planning grant, uh, and then we were informed that we received the full grant. So we are uh, six, literally three months ahead of schedule, and with a lot of what we're doing and trying to. I've never, I've never, never been in the space of trying to play catch up to figure out how much more can be done instead of what needs to be done from that standpoint. So. If I might, Dean, um, I know all of you have projects that have particular sort of foci and boundaries to them. And as you're doing them, you may come across people who are doing interesting things or want to do interesting things, but they don't really fit with what you're doing. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing information with them about the Children's Spirituality Hub or sharing information with me about people, um, it's possible that some of those folks might be um, uh, small innovators um, and be able to do, get small grants from the hub itself if it doesn't fit into the particular kind of thing you're doing. Um, on the Real Kids Real Faith website, we do have a link uh, for innovation and innovation grants that's just a um, inquire, you know, tell us uh, your idea and let us know about it. And um, and then we get an email and we get back in touch. So it's pretty easy if you direct people to that site and say, hey, um, share your idea. They might be interested. Um, we might be able to multiply even more things because um, we still have a couple million dollars to share. Is that the link that you already put in the chat? Yes. Okay. The realkidsrealfaith.org. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Actually, and um, I'm glad you brought, you you mentioned that. There, one of the things that we're discovering, and we we tried to be, uh, for for lack of a better way of saying it, we tried to be very intentional about working with children with autism in the Kansas City area, trying to keep recognizing that has large implications, but it is a special population to work with at the same time. But it has brought us into conversations around disability ministries with children. Where sometimes the question is not children with autism, but other forms of disability. Um, uh, Karen Marie, if there were creative options there, would that be the kind of thing that, that you would be interested in or not? I'm just curious. Absolutely. Uh, that That's actually an area where there's not a lot of literature and not a lot of, of work. And I mean, I wrote a chapter on ministering with children uh, with autism for a um, uh, pastoral care handbook uh, several years ago. And so I have it and I have a, a brother with uh, cognitive limitations. And so I am very interested in that personally. And I think it would be um, a great, like our work with children in trauma. It's another area that's vastly under-researched and under-resourced uh, yeah. for the church. Yeah, it's, um, uh, we, when we, chose two tracks uh partially it was because and, and within the field of design thinking prototypes do not always go well but sometimes they go too well and we wanted to have space to say if it's not going well in one area could we flex 
now it looks like we may actually be facing the opportunity of things going quite well in two very different areas simultaneously. Um, and um, wouldn't be the first time I have built a mousetrap that's bigger than what I intended. Um, well, so we'll see how that plays out. And I'm, I'm Ali, I'm kind of, I'm, I am in sabbatical right now, uh, though um, I've already reminded my dean it's not quite working out the way the original sabbatical plan was. So just fair warning to you before it's over. Anyone else? Anything else? No? Okay. Well, the famous phrase is all hearts clear at this point. Well, I, um, Camry, I think we'll we'll stay closer to the one hour and and uh, and go with that. I just thank you. I know most of you. We will see each other again in Indianapolis, but I hope we stay connected beyond that. Uh, and um, David, I'm looking forward to Dave. Sense, I'm looking forward to what you guys are generating uh, as well. So I, I hope you guys get connected in as time goes along. Also, me but, too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Hey, Marie, I'll just go ahead and say thank you. Thank you for your leadership and bringing this conversation back to the REA in this way. Uh, I think that's really a, a poignant and important piece of this conversation uh, for the association. So I appreciate you doing that. And hopefully I'll be able to join you guys at least a couple of times before the, the rest of the conference is over. But my prayers to everyone in your projects and blessings to all. And uh, we'll just call this um, an ending. And, um, and Camry, I'll let you close this since you're the tech. Blessings to uh, Yeah, no, um, blessings and mercy on all the work you're doing, everyone. And thank you so much. We'll see you in other sessions if you can. And keep in mind, um, they are recorded. So if you can't, you can still participate just next week or the week after or somewhere in August or whenever. So, but. Um, Take care. And uh, they always want me to say feedback. Please give them feedback. <laughs> yeah, okay. Do the evaluation. If nothing else, you can tell funny stories about me that you've already observed this time. Okay. All right. Bless everyone. Take care. Take care.